The stage is set for the UCI Gravel World Championships from Spresiana to Pieve di Soligo in Treviso in northeast Italy, in its Veneto region. A stunning setting. And some of the top riders in the world from all different disciplines meeting together in this wonderful crossover world of gravel. It's just the second World Championships. Fisher, New Zealand, it's a real mix up with Australians, Americans, Canadians, New Zealand's, the Dutch kind of stronghold all in the mix. Turning our attention to today's race, the elite men. We will be able to thankfully bring you some live coverage from that. The riders are out there at the moment. This is what happened this morning. Organizers in the Italian Federation were ready. Supporters were in for the second day running. And the European cycling president was here as well. Who was here to ride? That was the question. Well, lots of stars. Veneto, a hotbed of cycling in Italy. Alessandro De Marchi was here a week after riding the European Championships and having bad luck with a mechanical. He was riding with his brother. Same Italian national jersey on their backs. All eyes were on Spain. There was a Moser or two in presence as well. Alejandro Valverde retired for a year, back to race against the likes of Mate Mohoric and company. Valverde now well into his 40s, keeping fit. He's raced a couple of gravel events already and won them. This is the parkour for the men. Taking on uh, Collalto, first climb of the day after a flat start. A few time checks along the way. First at Rebine Lago, then across the finish line at Pieve di Soligo. That's after the climb. Up to Cal del Poggio. Then out for another loop. A check at Colbertaldo. A long flat section before two final climbs. San Vigilio and Le Serre with Le Tenade. And Colagu the final climb. Back end of this course, Savage. Four climbs in quick succession. And this was the scene at the start. Wild Fanat was in town as well on the right-hand side of the shot. From a road world champion there as well. Fanat having a mix of support from both trade team and national team. Belgian jersey on his back. And the reigning world champion, Gianni Vermeers, in his team. This time on a proper court mark, on a proper canyon gravel. So how will they go? New terrain, new horizons. And again, the Italian national anthem. Locals hoping it bring some luck. Keep your eyes on Cameron Mason as well, top crosser and mountain biker. Juan Garcia Cortina likes to smitch it up a bit, doesn't he? He's a very strong rider. And they're all ready to start. Uphill again, into the crowds, onto the gravel. And this year, as opposed to last year, into the hills. Obviously, last year's circuit, we it was it had some technicality, but unfortunately, it was in earlier in the race. Uh, in the first half, we had some difficult to sense difficult climbs, but the back end pretty flat. Here, it's almost reverse. We've got some lumps in the middle, uh, and and like I say, really difficult in the end. It was Cameron Mason in the British colours who would put in the strong start. It was full gas from the start. Beautiful weather for it. 21 degrees should have made it a fast race, really. Not as much mud around. But as you just heard there from Ollie, a more technical affair in terms of what they had to take on. Gianni Vermeer with at the front. Belgium with a really strong squad. Florian Vermeer's turning up too. 
And I say positioning, you know, it's, it's still going to be, it's 169 kilometers. They're going to be out there for five hours or so, but positioning from the start, really important. You know, in, in, a, in a long road race, you've got some time to, to relax, kind of settle into it. Here, you don't want to waste any time. You don't want to get stuck in that mid-pack. Uh, more chance of punctures, and it's technical from the start today. Well, a large field. Gravel specialists and riders from all sorts of different disciplines with a big World Tour road pros turning up this year en masse. So they went to the Murilica del Poggio, and after a very good start for Wat van Aert, I can tell you he had a crash and was off the back many minutes down so in the front and not too far including the group of Alejandro Valverde ahead we had this group Mate Mohoric, Florian Vermeers and Connor Swift athletes from Slovenia, Belgium and Great Britain you know, I say we went through that third check about 97 kilometers in big group of nine and then just after that on the next line we saw a split with these three going clear there's now a second group on the road. Uh, Keegan Svensson, US champion, Valverde, De Marquis, seventh in the world last year. A real strong second group, but these three guys, you have know, powered clear now, and they're approaching that kind of last third of the circuit where we're seeing some really difficult climbing now. Well, this was a little earlier still, the Mordica del Poggio. Fantastically strong climb, a difficult one that we've seen in the Giro d'Italia previously and around the Prosecco grapevines. This is the group that you were talking about. Valverde was here. Paul Voss, again, having another very good weekend. He was up there in the Worlds last year, in the Euros, pardon me, last week. Yeah, yeah. He was up on the podium. Alessandro De Marchi having a good day as well. And there is uh, Keegan Swenson there for the United States, running 2 2 five. Yeah, and this is last year, but he was very successful in the US, pretty much winning every big gravel race out there. Um, but in but Mr. Gravel Worlds last year, kind of preferred to stay back at home. Uh, this year he's got involved and, you know, he's a big favourite, big gravel specialist. So it's great to see him up in the mix today. But DeMarkey, seventh last year at Worlds, obviously super stellar road career, but uh, a gravel specialist almost these days. Well, this, in terms of surface, was one of the easier parts of the day, but the gradient balanced things out, didn't it? You're talking double digits all yeah. the way up here. Yeah, such a savage, you know, one just over a kilometre long, but, yeah, 12% average. <laughs> it's like absolutely torturous climb. But Svensson looking strong. There were plenty of riders as well going through what was a fantastic collection of fans. Two days and a real party both days out there. I've seen this before in the Giro. Time trials and road races here. Svensson was trying to pull away earlier on. De Marchi was making sure he wasn't going anywhere. Alessandro De Marchi racing in the same team as his brother for Italy. We see Paul Voss at the back, third at European Champs last week, like you say, in, in a great sprint finish but really strong, ex-pro road, um, Tour de France rider previously, but coming, he's one of the true gravel specialists. So in this group, De Marquis still racing for Jaco on the road. Svensson, gravel specialist, Valverde, retired. <laughs> and then Fulvos, gravel specialist. So a real mixed bag in this one. But it looks like Svensson on that side, on left side, he's pretty beat up. There's a few cuts on the arms, shoulders down. So it looks like he's had a tumble at some point earlier on today. Well, we remind you that these are still recorded images from a little earlier on, but Wart van Aert crashed just before this point and is now many minutes down. Okay, but before we do go live, getting images, and, or we're getting timings rather, from the fi final time check before we go to the finish. And after, well, three hours, 40-odd minutes of racing, there's still a group of three away. This is the group of four chasing on. That's where we've been. This is where we are now, heading in to the final 30 or so kilometers. And these are the three leaders as we go live. Connor Swift there still with Matej Mohoric and Florian Vermeers. And look at the gap, 29.9 kilometers to go, three minutes and 50 seconds. So barring any disaster here, 
the podium is decided already, Ollie. Yeah, we're not far in now. We're just coming up. We had this long flaction before, before the last climb. We were just seeing the pictures of on the Poggio. We had a long flat. And these, obviously, these three have been working super well together. Mohoric, we know his strength on the flat. And you can see still driving, super aero tucked down. And they've just driven this gap, you know, that was floating around that minute on the last climbs. On this long flat section, we're now approaching the four minutes. And like I say, that podium looking pretty strong. And this is the group behind. They're chasing together. It's Foss, Balverde, Schoenberger, De Marchi. Hermons is there alongside a man from the United States who is a specialist alongside Foss, Svensson. We just see Schoenberger at the bottom for Austria in the red. Balverde, again, I mean, doesn't look like he's going to be on the podium today, but what a bike rider. He's the last surviving man furthest in the race for Spain, and you've got riders in the Spanish team who have won races. <laughs> in professional bike riders this year like Ivan Garcia Cortina. It is incredible. Yeah, unbelievable. But yeah, Valverde, I say, one of the legends of the sport, but his version of retirement this year, two World Gravel Series races he's managed to win. So he's, uh, he hasn't been sitting down with a pipe and slippers. He's been absolutely shredding it on a gravel bike. So this was one of his aims for the year, kind of post-road retirement, which is crazy. I have it on very good authority as well that he wanted to come back and race on the road this year. So much he hates being at home, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I joke with that, but so much he misses the sport. But you could see that second group, not a lot of input at us, all looking at each other. You look at the front guys really driving it, sweeping out on the corners, carrying speed. This second group, all kind of looking at each other to taking on. You can almost see the fatigue in that group. They're racing through these fields of grapes in Prosecco country in northeast Italy in the Veneto. It's a beautiful day for it. So, I mean, you, can you imagine had you had a bit of proper October weather? We were talking yesterday about the Giro di Lombardia and the fact that the race, the leaves weren't even on the turn, never mind falling for the Classica delle Foglie Morte. But here, if we'd had the, the autumn weather you can get in these parts with a lot of rain, a lot of cold, plenty of wind, that it would have been a completely different race, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would have been a savage day out today. And, and all this fast rolling kind of chalk road to end up turning into almost a muddy paste. Um, and we've seen that, you know, rarely at the start of the year in, in, in Strada Bianchi. And, and, hope, and it's grow great to see the speed, um, riding this gravel speed, bikes at full speed, dry conditions. I think it just makes it, visually it looks more impressive, but also as well, I think it makes more exciting racing than a kind of mud fest. Well, in the green jersey, you've got Matej Mohoric, who's had one of his most successful moments in road cycling on Italian soil. That's when he won Milano San Remo a couple of years ago now. Just in front of him, Connor Swift. Of course, he's been the British national road champion before. And Florian Vermeers, who's won a couple of races. However, he is a man who's finished on the podium of Paris-Roubaix. They're top bike riders on the road, but they're showing that they can adapt to anything. We know with Mohoric that he's a thinker, he's an excellent technician. Even when he won his Milano San Remo, he was using tech from mountain biking, wasn't he, with his dropper post. Yep. Vermeer showed last week at the Euros is good. I know that you've watched a little bit of Connor Swift on a gravel bike, and he's pretty handy as well. He's shown that with a couple of results already. Yeah, there was a, a gravel. So there's a gravel World Series of 12 races that have kind of combined to make a World Series. And for a lot of riders, especially the age group riders, it's their qualification for the Worlds. Um, but there was a race up in Scotland in about May time. Um, he took part in that and absolutely smashed it to bits, five, six minutes up from the rest of the field. So he, you can imagine he's had a sense of doing this. This isn't a last minute thing. This is something that's been planned before. Obviously, he rides for Ineos, he's on a Pinarello, and he's actually riding the new X Pinarello, which is down as their endurance road. They do a, a very specific gravel bike, uh, but he's riding their newly launched X series bike. I just see it's got a very distinctive rear end, uh, takes a slightly wider tire, and he's obviously shredding that today. But, you know, Pinarello, local roads, they would like somebody to be uh, near the podium. Pauline from Fravo in the women's race, again, Ineos rider. She unfortunately missed the women's race due to still suffering from COVID. So it's fallen for Pinarello. On, on Connor Swift today, and he's doing a classic ride and making this front group. So Swift there in the white jersey. Of course, this is just the second year of the Gravel World Championships, and only Belgium have won it. It was a Vermeers. No relation of the man, the other Vermeers in this group. This is Florian. If he can win, at least they'll be keeping the surname the same on the Palmares. Florian Vermeers has already shown that 
despite being a young rider, he's a strong rider. We've seen that two weeks running now. We saw it in Belgium last week. He was up there with the very best, and he is putting another strong performance in, isn't he? Yeah, what's interesting, obviously, he's most famous for his Paris-Roubaix podium, but, but pre-road was also a, a cyclocross professional as well, and a really good under-23 and junior rider. So this isn't kind of unnatural to him, um, whereas it, it'll be supernatural. He'll probably still train on the cross bike if he rode it when he was younger. So that feeling of kind of the wheels being so loose underneath you won't be, won't be a strange feeling to him. Um, so it's a real mixed bag of riders, obviously all plying their trade week on week on the road, but all have an off-road background. Um, um, and also, like I say, that all are known for their technical ability. Of course, technical ability is hugely important here. You need it. You can see the twisting and turning, the different surfaces. But of course, with the distance of this race, well over 160 kilometers, how important is it to have that endurance and have that speed and rhythm? And is this why we're seeing a lot of the, the road pros able to beat the gravel specialists? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the, if you looked at the shopping list, the requirements that they need to, to, to succeed in this race, the biggest one is that strength endurance and the, that fresh hole power that they need. That's the kind of number one. But underpinning that, to, you, you need a technical skill to ride in this race. It's no good just having a big engine. Um, you need to be able to pick the course, keep your bike in one piece. Obviously, we saw, I mean, Wout Van Aert's an amazing bike handler, but he's out the race today or, or, or long way back in the race due to, due to a crash. So it's not just horsepower. It's not a time trial on a flat road on this one. They've got to be able to get themselves, A, get the bike to the finish, and B, carry speed. So we saw before, just a minute ago, I was just lodging Connor Swift on the corner, just getting a couple of metres on everybody else, and he just pinned it round. And it's that feeling of picking the line, and we see getting the, the edges to keep the grip. Um, there'll be a lot of riders in today that have got an, an amazing fresh hole power, FTP or, or, or endurance, but just can't quite get that power to translate onto a gravel bike. 25 kilometers remain. Just talked about the distance being just a kilometer or two short of 170. But there's almost 2,000 meters of climbing as well today. And they're different climbs. They're not steady climbs, although they are short, sharp climbs with pretty horrendous gradients as we come to the town of Fontana. Yeah, and the climbs that are love of the looser surface, you, come, you can't spin up them or, or get out the saddle and use body weight a little more. You have to sit down and kind of use a bit of oomph and, and a low rev to get a bit of torque through the pedals and um, that uses a slightly different strength and we see guys in, in, in the same way that in Flanders on the cobbles on a wet day you have to sit in, in a slightly bigger gear and it just really hits that strength endurance in a slightly different way to a kind of smoother alpine climb. On a swift in the centre there already a winner of the race on the road that has those additions of off-road sections, Troubrolion up in northwest France. This is Florian Vermeer, the second in Paris Roubaix, fifth last week at the European Championships. Explaining that we knew he had a bit of form already. He's 24 now, rides on the road for Lotto Destiny. He represents his Belgian national team here. And these three guys, for the minute, essentially are teammates, and they have been for a long, long time in this race now, eking out a gap that is just two seconds short of four minutes. Now, when does this change? Because we're inside the final 25 k's, Ollie. We've got a few climbs coming up. They've all got to start thinking about how they're going to win this race now. Yeah, I mean, now it's, it's a nice situation to be in. Always, if you're going to get away in a group of three, happy days. You know, you know that no one's going to be sandbagging. No one's thinking of, well, I'm going to be the guy who gets fourth. So it's a perfect situation to be in a group of three. But coming into this back end of the course now, 24k to go. We've got four climbs in pretty quick succession. And we can see the, the San Vigialo approaching us now and that's a you know it's a short climb only 0.4k but up to 22 percent maximum so absolutely savage it looks pretty horrible and again it's just one of those roads that's used to service the vineyards really you see a lot of these in switzerland on the lakes of or the shores of lake geneva i should say here we are up with the prosecco grape vines and we'll start the climb and we've seen the first move and it's out the back it's Connor Swift who can't hack the pace. Swift starts to struggle as soon as it goes uphill. Average gradient this for 400 metres at 15.5%. And already that's quite a big difference, isn't it? Yeah, and you can see a bit loose gravel. There's a bit of tarmac here, but it's not ideal. We've still got to sit down. There's drainage, there's water bars. See, kind of Mohoric really go. Good tempo, pushing hard, and it's Connor Swift, the first victim. 
Mohoric visually looks the best of the three here, doesn't he? You can see Florian Vermeers grinding away. Yeah, so let's say this climb only 0.4k, but it's only another 7k or so to again another longer climb. And this is last, this back end of the course is so, so tough today. And this is the difference between the course last year. Last year they were flying along at 40k an hour during this point with hardly any climbs to go. Uh, this year we've got more technicality, more climbs, and I think everyone would agree a, a, a better gravel course for a world. Well, Connor Swift will be wanting to try and hang on here for as long as he can, just keep this difference down to the minimum, because if there's an incident or these two look at each other once they're back on the short sections of flat that remain, there's a chance. The other thing as well, off the way back down, it's how technical this descent if it stays on the road but if connor swift could just roll back on the top but he sees suffering a lot now but if he can try and get back on before that next climb before the flat section chance but it looks like the lights are going out san vigilio is proving to be the undoing of connor swift is there a chance to hang on he'll certainly give us all in the meantime, it's Mohoric oh, on on the descent. He's already opening up. Well, you know how good he is. Not quite the podge of this, but he still managed to eke out that little bit of a gap to Florian Vermeers, who now must really work hard to close the gap. And that's already advantage to Mohoric. If he can just pull out a little bit of a gap without too much of an effort, it's these repeated efforts to get back on that are going to do the damage to Vermeers. 100%. If, when it's this stage in the race, you don't want to leave that kind of five, six minute gap, to, especially to someone like Mohoric. He's so slippery, you know, you can see he's always on the drops. He's a very proficient rider technically, but he, he knows about his tech as well. You know, he's, we, he's famously using his drop seat post to reduce his seat height during that Milan San Remo descent for the win. But he's a smart rider, not just technically very smart, but, but tech wise smart too. Look at this already 48 seconds out of nowhere on a 400 meter climb that's incredible and how quickly things and how quickly things can change with you starting to suffer so quickly yeah the last thing you need if you're just having maybe a little bit of an energy drop a bit hunger knock to hit a 50 you know 400 meter really steep climb that's the last thing you need you just want to be able to almost get a get an energy gel down you get some calories in hopefully keep on the flat and sit in the wheels and just kind of blag it for a bit but that climb just coming at you probably just the wrong time for connor swift hopefully you can regroup like I say, have a little break on the descent, get some calories in. I think he'll float back to now to that second group. But then you're in the mix again. There's, there's still a medal up for grabs. But these two guys, he's four minutes out, 23k to go. They're looking pretty solid for that, that first and second. But in these gravel races, you can never... It's never done till it's done. Of course, a lot of people will be joining us for the first time and, and watching gravel racing for the first time, simply by the very nature of the fact that there's not much of it on us we saw yesterday we're very lucky to be watching this today we've been assured by the uci something that really in all honesty should have happened already we're going to have parity of coverage as a requirement now at each and every uci world championships um no race radio no. we can see the gaps how do these guys know what gap they have? What sort of information is there in the race? I mean, we've got during the feed. So the main thing is today, obviously, compared to, to, a, to a road race, you've got following cars, we've got race radios, like you say. Today, they're on their own. This is going old school. You know, they've got to repair their own bikes. There's eight tech, tech stroke feed zones during the course where they can get technical assistance, swap a tire. They have to start finish on the same frame or same bike, but they can swap bits in a tech zone. Um, and they can grab water. At there, they'll get feeds. They may have a bit of assistance distance on the on the course from the side but in general they've just got to fit focus more on what they can see what they can feel and it probably goes almost back to when they were juniors again um, and less orchestrated by a director sportif in a car they've got to they've got to broaden their senses a little bit more well, we are looking at Connor Swift who is around 52 seconds behind again we are waiting to see what sort of information could be shared who knows where everybody is? We go through the stream there. It's Vermeers just taking the very slight advantage as Mohoric deals with it well. And this is a difficult period. Look at that big, big rocks here. It's almost mountain bike stuff, this. Yeah, and I think this is where Florian Vermeers with his 
cross background, just technically a little more proficient. You saw him come out of that corner. Mohoric was changing gear on the way out. Ideally, you want to set your gear before a technical turn. So just dropping into that riverbed, you've got your speed set, you've got your gear set. Um, that was what Vermish was doing. Mohoric a bit more clunky, you know, it was a bit late. And as a result, the uh, the gap just opens up a little bit. So I think we've got a situation. I think Mohoric may be physically a little stronger at this stage in the race, but Vermish probably technically a little better. Interesting how everything comes together to pull out the final result as we see now Swift going through the first of the two river crossings there under this very, very difficult pass that's full of lots of thick stones. The old branch that's fallen, lots of grass and moss as he comes through the river again. Off into this small mud section now. Again, it's been very, very dry recently. That's one of the only water sections. And they're back on the road very, very quickly, all in the space of a kilometre or so. But it's this real mix. You've got dropping into those slightly more, those, it's the water crossings and the ravines. That's where you're going to get the bigger rocks. That's where you're going to get the mud, the dirt. That's the chance where you're more likely to make a bad gear change. You know, it, the worst case of that, when you really have an awful gear change, it can put a lot of stress and load through the chain. So snap chains are quite common in, in gravel, mountain bike, very rare on the road. Um, and obviously the obvious one is flat tyres. The guys running today, most of the riders pre-ride were running a 40 mil tyre uh, on the road now, 28 is probably the most standard, so a wider tyre. Most of them will be running uh, a tubeless setup. Uh, so no inner tube, standard tyre, but running a sealant inside, which will fix the smaller form punctures, but a big impact on a rock will slice the tyre, and quite often the sealant won't be able to have enough oomph to, to seal it. Um, so it's it's really looked like kind of conserving not just your energy, but conserving your bike on a day like today. Connor Swift just checking the shoes, settling in again, trying to get some rhythm back. He's just over 21 kilometres from the finish. Three, four hundred metres up the road, the race leaders. Yeah, we're not far away from the the next climb coming up, the La Sierra. It's Matej Mohoric in the green from Slovenia. The Belgian Florian Vermeers, remember Gianni Vermeers, no relation, last year was the inaugural gravel world champion. The same Veneto region. Next year will, by the way, be in Belgium. In fact, where we were last week, isn't it, for World Championships? Yeah, and a, and a different style of circuit. And that's a nice thing with gravel. You get such a mixed bag, depending on where you're riding. A lot of off-road last week in the European Champs, um, but pretty flat, more of a kind of classics course. And we saw Jasper Stoyven, you know, a real classic specialist, using real horsepower and strength to win that one. Nothing really that required... You know, too many climbing legs like today, but the average speed at the European Championships last year was 39 kilometers an hour, which was <laughs> bonkers fast, you know, almost road, road speed. Here is Connor Swift, as you can see, there's a couple of very short technical sections coming up in and around that and then onto the concrete here. Another of these little road stroked paths that are used by those who tend the vineyards. Again, a longer climb than last one, 2.4k, but an average of 6.3%. But again, these little steep sections peaking at 19%. And this little section just coming up now, you know, it's really going to get down deep into the muscles. It's going to be straining first gear. See Vermeesh on a wider, bigger cassette. He's running one chain ring on the front um, and a wider cassette on the back. So it's, it's trying to have that range. And it's something, again, with the tech before the race today. Road bikes generally still running two rings. Uh, a lot of gravel bikes running one. Um, the main difference would be you don't quite have the top gear, so if it does come down to a road sprint, you'd probably be wanting to run the two chain rings on the front, uh, the one a little bit lighter, less chance of mechanicals on a front mech. So again, it's so many little tech choices um, with the gravel bikes, not just the tyres, but the gear ratios. Um, whether some riders are running road pedals and a, and a single-sided and a carbon shoe, or running a mountain bike style pedal, which is heavier, but if it does, you do need to get off the bike, it's going to be a lot easier. So these all these little tech choices of gravel, which make things so interesting. Tech choices to how they film the race as well. Very different. This is a small camera on the helmet of the motorcycle pilot who's following that. Um, in terms of the riders' tech choices, as we see Connor Swift fading to almost a minute and a half now, how long do they have to make those decisions? You know, how, how long will riders generally turn up before? Will they have three or four days? Will they ride the whole course once? Will they just ride sections of the course? 
We were seeing a lot of riders not doing it in one go, um, just from looking at guys on social media and their feedback, probably splitting up into two days of recce. -ing. Ideally, you'd want to ride the whole course uh, just to get a feeling for it, but definitely the first kind of 5K when you're all in a bottleneck, and, and, and without a doubt, this last half and these last descents now, you really want to... It's difficult to remember it in its entirety. It's so technical, you can't remember every turn and every rock, but you've got to get a feeling of when it's dodgy, uh, when you can let the, the brakes go and when you've got something where you really have to back off. Um, something like this descent now would be... A, it's a key part of the race. You see Mohoric really pressing on. Um, they, they want to have pre-ridden this for sure. Well, this is incredible. Again, Mohoric once more on the downhill, looks behind, he's opened up another little bit of a gap. And again, it's likely that Vermeers will get back on here. However, he's had to make that extra bit of effort to do so. Yeah, Mohoric, this is, this is kind of connecting sections between the climbs and descent. It's just so strong. We see him road racing week in, week out in the breakaway. Always on the drops, always one of the strongest, always driving it. And, he, and no different today in this. And he's just, to me, she's say, just taking those little bit of little gaps, putting the hurt on him, and every one of those is a lovely little punch in the ribs. Well, here they go again, uphill once more. As you said, uh, four climbs towards the end, back to back here, all packed into the last 20 to 25 k's. Yeah, so this is, we're not far away now, another climb coming up, the Lentonade again, a steep one, about a kilometre along. Again, it's this horrible surface where the ridges to try and give more grip to the farm vehicles around here. and um, But from a bike rider, you, it really does take the edge off. And you can see Mohoric just getting the gap, putting the hurt on. Mohoric is there again, continuing to tap away at the pedals. He looked the stronger of the three on the first of the big climbs on San Vigilio. We've seen uh, Vermeer's strong on the flat. So decent technically. However, it's Mohoric on those descents where he has the technical edge as they're on to Le Serre here, 2.4 kilometers long, 6.3% average, but look at the percentage below that, maximum gradient of 19%. And that steepest part, they've just crested. They do a steep part at the bottom, there's now a little descent, which Vermeer will absolutely be loving. It just gives him his chance to get his breath back, get back on the wheel, just get an extra couple of bit of long, long breaths in, and then before you know it, it's going to get into a really long, gradual climb. We can see it snaking off into the distance, and it's about another K and a half, hitting kind of eights and seven percent all the way up to the top. Well, the Veneto Italy putting on its best face for us today. Looking beautiful. Oh, this wind, doesn't it? Yeah, this is the deep blue again. gravel really really tough to ride on you can't use all your strength and if you've got good energy at the moment like we see Mohoric he's got that ability to to read the road know when you can put in a pedal stroke a bit tougher when you need to back off a little bit it's when you get tired and fatigue here that's when you start to get the wheel spin on this loose gravel and that's when the gaps can open and there is a small gap opening here keep your eye on this one because Florian Vermeers again is in trouble and it's a long, long way to the top yet. So the fact he's swinging already, he's got about another K, K and a half. He's just got to try and stabilise and then hope. But, 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 but the issue we've seen is Mohoric is so strong on the descents as well. You know, he's gapping Vermeesh on that last descent, especially on the road, the road sections. So Vermeesh has got to dig deep now. Well, Mate Mohoric has seen a gap's opening up. He's back onto the pedals and this could be the moment that he rides away to the world title. Florian Vermeers has to really dig deep now because Mate Mohoric is close, very, very close to taking this. Yeah, Mohoric on a mission now. Really, really pushing hard, so strong, rolling that gear around. Vermeers bouncing a little bit. And for the first time on that very short section, Mohoric disappears from view as Vermeers tries to push on. Yeah, and psychologically, Mate Mohoric now has the gap. Psychologically, if you can get round a corner on these switchbacks and be out of sight, that's just so demoralising to the to the chasing rider. If they can just see you, and you've got that bait in front, you can just chase. But if you can get round that corner here, Vermeers should come round, look up and see nothing. And that's so demoralising. Mate Mohoric already has rainbow jerseys. In the youth categories, remember, on the road. 
He's looking for one on the gravel here, and look how steep this is. What an atmosphere up here. And he's loving it. He's got a nine-second gap. But Vermeers isn't out the game yet. He's working. He's fighting. He's swinging. Yeah, and he's holding that gap. You know, it was, it was 11 seconds. He's pulled it back to seven. He's got him back within his sights. This is not done. Not done at all. Great to see the fight shown by Florian Vermeers. Yeah, it looked like he was swinging in bike terms a moment ago. It's now the bike that he is fighting as he moves side to side. Mohoric, has he gone into the red and given too much? Such a tough climb, this, and a mix of surfaces going from kind of thick gravel to light gravel, then to those kind of water barred kind of tarmac roads. Really difficult to get into your rhythm. Ideally, when you've got a steep climb like this and you're suffering, you just want a nice, smooth road, steady gradient, and it sees ups and downs, ins and outs. And it looks like descent coming off the top of this one is looking a bit more gravelly, which possibly could suit for Misha a bit more. Seven seconds, here we go. Mohor, it's just off to the right-hand side of your shot, going past those little huts where those who pick the grapes get a chance to rest. Your little house, and nowadays, of course, summer houses, a lot of them would have been traditional houses for those who farm the land. And just coming up to this house where it starts to go down here is Vilmirs, who's on the chase. Nine seconds now, we see. I think this is going to be a full-on descent. Obviously, the race is completely on now. Ten-second gap, gravel descent. It's going to be hair-raising, this one. Mate Mohoric, who has been a world champion in the youth categories in road cycling. He's won stages in all three of cycling's grand tours. He's a monument winner in San Remo. He's won stage race titles overall as well. He is a fantastically versatile rider, and he is trying to take the gravel world title ahead of a man who showed that he has real aptitude for the classics after having started off-road. It's a fascinating battle, this. Ten seconds between Mahi Motoric of Slovenia and Florian Vermeers of Belgium. Yeah, and this we talked before about the wrecking of the course, and this is where it really comes in, that knowledge of the circuit. They're descending here at full speed, knowing which bits are tarmac. You're then suddenly flicking to gravel. Um, there'll be gravel on the corners, and it's really knowing when you can push. And Mohoric, like I say, he's a, he, he knows how to push on a descent, but you've got to know the surface. Uh, and it's such a technical descent, this, and then you throw in a mixture of good or bad tarmac, and it just makes the technicality go through the roof. Mohoric eking out the seconds on the downhill. How do they compare looking at them? For me, she's just, he looks a little stiffer. I mean, he's a bit more fatigued. When on it's on the loose stuff, the technical stuff, especially on the climbing, Vermish looks a bit smoother. On the faster road descents, Mohoric is, is so good. He picks the corners, the apex, he knows exactly how wide to go. He's super confident and he's very low on the bike. So Mohoric is always on the drops. He's one of those riders that rides seem seemingly everywhere on the drop bars. Center of gravity is therefore a little bit lower. Vermish, a taller rider, but also he's always up on the, on the levers. So just a little more clunky around some of the corners. 15 seconds now for Mohoric, who goes uphill again. Yeah, and if we had a long climb before, fast ascent straight into another climb now. 900 metres along, again, a max gradient of 12, so not the toughest one, but it's just relentless. Litinade, 900 metres long, as you said, 6.5%, 12 maximum. And this is the concrete surface of it. Good cadence from Mohoric, he's always looked strong on the climbs. Yeah, physically, he looks super stable at the moment, and on that descent, just gained another seven seconds from the top over Vermeesh, so using that skill on the tarmac descending to just extend that gap. But Vermeesh, you know, he's, he's, he's fighting, he's digging in hard, you can see he's all over the bike a little bit, but he's working really, really hard, and it's if he can close that gap and it's just coming down a little bit, you know, if he can get that down to that kind of seven, eight seconds again at the crest, I think we've got a chance. It's then a really long descent off the top of this one before we then start the last two climbs. Well, Mateusz Govekar was one of the other big Slovenian representatives, also a trade teammate from Mohoric, but it's Mohoric, the main man, who survived at the front of the race. Florian Vermeers is Belgium's last remaining hope here. Wout van Aert has crashed well behind, we are told. Defending champion Gianni Vermeers off the pace as well, too. Jan Bakkelans turned up as well for Belgium, but it is Florian Vermeers who is 16 seconds back and fighting. Yeah, and Gianni Vermeers, last year's course, 
a little flatter, a little faster, suited more to his style. Um, today, a little, you know, steeper, hillier, so more of like the hilly classics. And the riders before described it as a as a rougher kind of Strada Bianchi. And, and it's those sort of riders that can perform well in that race that will come to the fore in this one as well. It's the climbing of Strada Bianchi that's difficult as Mohoric's not happy, I think, maybe with a helicopter there. He's on up there because he, you could just see a little bit of wind around. I if that was coming from the helicopter. Yeah, and the dust as well. Obviously, if the helicopter's getting down too low, it's going to really going to blow this dust up, which as a rider, when you're on your absolute limit, uh, isn't going to be the nicest. But you can see it's just trying to get... In Mahoric, he's got the power. It's just getting that power down from his legs down to the floor. And it's that thick gravel where you've just got to pick your line, really choose a comfortable cadence, um, slightly sl lower cadence than you'd probably pick on a road climb. You just need to kind of slow the pedaling rate down and get, produce a little more torque instead, and that helps give a little more traction. Um, but for me, she's, like I say, still looking really strong, 18 seconds. 15 kilometers remain in the World Gravel Championships for the men in Veneto, northeast Italy. 18 seconds for lead now for Matej Mohoric. Slovenia looking for a second day of success on Italian soil after Tarej Pogaccia took the Giro di Lombardia yesterday. That scenic race and this is no different. Looking absolutely stunning. Great thing about this discipline as well is discovering parts of the world oh. that you probably can't do. Oh no, 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 no. Flat. It is a oh, flat no, and a big one. It's the chain that's off. It looked like he was bouncing around a little, didn't it? But nope, he's yeah. going to continue. Thankfully, the tyre all right, but the chain was the issue there. And that's going to cost him a few more seconds. Yeah, this is the, the possible disadvantage we talked about. Vermish running one chain ring on the front, so it doesn't have a front derailleur. The downside is some of the real rough terrain. There's no front derailleur to hold it on. If it does bounce off for some reason, a really bad gear change or, or, or just bad luck, there's nothing to stop it coming off it completely like it did with Vermish then. Some guys will use a um, single chain ring, but will just have a small device, just uh, almost like a loop uh, to hold the front chain ring on. But yeah, I mean, if you're going to pick chain off or flat tyre, chain off every day. So I think he's lucky there. Solid dismount as well from his cross days. As you can see, it was pretty smooth. No panic, dealt with it well, very, very quickly. And... Well, we've seen he seems to have lost anything between five and ten seconds. There we go, about eight seconds, I think. Yeah, the last thing you want, he was still, the morale was still OK. He was holding that kind of 15, 60 seconds, looking smooth on the descent. He's added ten. I mean, it's, it's a, re a real kick, that. Going at now to almost half a minute as Mohoric again continues to just pull out curve by curve on the descents. One thing we did see, Vermish, we talked about the technical parts before, was using a, a road, single-sided road pedal and shoe and having to do a full-on cyclocross mount and clip back in with carbon shoes and, and road pedals. Easier said than done. Uh, some people are using a, a mountain bike style, so a double-sided pedal and a, and a shoe with a, with a, with a recess cleat, um, making life far easier to get on and off. But they're a bit heavier, uh, not quite as much uh, stiff with the power transfer. But Vermish and I think Mohoric as well, both using road pedals and shoes today. Intriguing mix. A lot of it's personal choice as well as the conditions on the day as well. Imagine if it had been a mod fest, there might have been plenty of different choices as well because of that. Yeah, and the big thing is the tyres. For the gravel racing, the, the amount of tread that you have on the tyre is huge. So we've got a mix today between tarmac, where the fastest tyre will be a slick tyre, and then obviously onto some some loose terrain where you'd want some sort of tread mostly on the side. So they're almost be having a really light like file tread they will call it on the center with some mountain bike style like lugs on the side or nobbles on the side uh, but we saw a real mix there was a couple of kind of I saw online felt van art almost using a, a, a gravel file tread so, uh, tire throughout um, but that's the sort of thing where they'll change the tires almost last minute depending on the conditions of the course the conditions coming up um, and but the tire chain the tire Resistance, whether you're having grip uh, or slick, is, makes a huge, huge difference on these bikes. Seems as though the live images for now disappear. We've gone to the finish line where it's thumbs up from those watching. They await the winner who's well on his way now. He's, his kilometres are ticking by quickly as he's descending again, but he does have to climb. Yeah, long descent, but this final climb 
is one hell of a hill. 1.35 kilometers, 11.8% average, but peaking just right at the very, very top at 23%. Well, this is new for young and old, and there's a lot of traditional cycling fans in this region. It's a great to see a good turnout, isn't it? Yes, cracking event. You know, I, I love the gravel, and I love the, the combination of, of, of disciplines, of terrain, uh, the tech that all comes together. We saw in the women's race a real mix of, of gravel specialists, road stars, uh, and, and mountain bike as well. Last year. Pauline from Prevo, kind of a, the, the true all-rounder, winning all three disciplines, uh, in, in, in two in mountain bike and one in gravel, mixing it with the road road superstars. And I, I think it's a really interesting mix. And I think it's, a, it's only going to grow in stature. Now you wait to see what the situation is as we go into the final climb. From the graphics we're seeing, the gap seems to be growing. 36 seconds. It looks as though it might have been the final nail in the coffin that the mechanical just as when it looked as though Vermeer was stabilizing the crisis. And obviously Vermeer was on the back foot, but you know there'll still be some sort of hope there. Um, but yeah, mechanical off the bike on the bike. You'll get a little adrenaline rush the moment you get back on, and you'll probably close a few seconds just out of pure anger. But then the reality will kick in that you've thrown time away. So. Well, we wait for the live images to return. Whilst we do that, we're going to have a look at how the winning move, as it is at the minute, unless something changes, could well be put together. We saw Connor Swift dropped. That was on San Vigilio. He'd been in a group of three that had gone away with a long, long way, over half of the race to go. Group of six chasers at over four minutes, and then Matej Mohoric and Florian Vermeer very quickly opening up almost a minute and then turned into over a minute on the British star. Then this happened. Vermeer very briefly opening up a small gap. Mohoric struggling mechanically in terms of ability and technical ability, I think, as well. Mohoric, of course, very, very gifted by Pardew. But Vermeer coming from cross. Then they were together again. It was over a minute at this point as we started climbing once more. And on this climb, with just under 20 kilometers to go, Matej Mohoric started to pull away. Bit by bit, the gap started to open up. It was three seconds, turned to five, and before he knew it, 15 to 20 seconds was the gap. Still plenty of things that could change, though. Vermeer starting to really stabilise things. But we saw how easy it was, you know, for Vermeer to have a mechanical, lose 10 seconds. That could easily be Mohoric on this descent. There's a long descent before this last stiff climb. You know, a, ch a chain drop, a small mechanical, a small crash, or the most obvious thing, you know, a, a flat tyre. If you lose a flat tyre, that 30 seconds will become a 30 seconds up to, to more than a 30 second deficit. Well, it was here on this section that Florian Vermeers had an issue, lost his chain, had to dismount, had to put the chain back on. Reminder, no mechanical assistance in this discipline. And this is the situation. It's 38 seconds, we're told now, with 10 kilometers to go. Uh, hoping, desperately hoping, that the organizers can bring us back the live pictures. I say 10k to go. This last you know, horrible, horrible ascent comes 7k to the finish. So uh, it would be great to get back online to show that one in its entirety because. And we saw it in the women's race, how stiff on in, almost crawling over the top. It was that steep at that last final section, 23%. Again, in the women's race, the decision had been made, hadn't it, by that point, with uh, Nivia Dommer out the front, but holding on. Again, can Mohoric do what the Polish star did 24 hours ago? Kilometres continue to tick by with 9.8 k's from the finish.
and it's 36 seconds of a gap. If you're just tuning in, it's Matem Mohoric, who's ahead of Florian Vermeers. In third place, as it stands, Connor Swift, but we've lost his time gap at the moment. The last check, around five to 10 kilometers or so ago, he was at a minute and a half. We had a further group at over four minutes. I can tell you that that group consisted of Keegan Swenson, the gravel specialist for the United States. Now specialist to former road pro Paul Foss, Sebastian Schoenberger, Alejandro Valverde, yes, you're not hearing things. He was there as well. Alessandro De Marchi and Quinton Hermons was that chasing group. Yeah, and Sebastian Schoenberger doing a great ride. Oh, here we go. We're back. That is very good news. Just in time as well. As we're back with Mate Mohoric. As we said, rainbow jersey on the road in the youth categories. He looks back here twice as well. So you mentioned it before, no race radios today. So he's just trying to use that, that long flat section just to get a look back. And I think he'll see what he likes to his least see, he'll like what he sees. Nice big gap for Mish. He won't know that obviously for Mish had a technical on that last descent, but 37 seconds, big old gap. Thirty-eight seconds, yes. That big old gap, as I finish the sentence, grows to 39. This is Mate Mohoric's race to lose now, but as you've already stressed, there's a little bit, more than a little bit, looking around here from Mohoric. You wonder if mechanically everything's okay. We saw the effect that a mechanical can have on Florian Vermeers behind. Quickly, 10 seconds disappeared into nowhere, and that horrendous climb that you spoke about. Yeah, and I think Mohoric, you're never going to be truly comfortable in a race like this you know it's not a it's not an easy finish he's got a really difficult climb to go followed obviously by by the technical descent as well so you'd, you'd want to have a pretty big buffer no one at this stage after a race today the speed they've gone the technicality of the climbs you're not gonna no one's gonna feel good at this point so Mohoric he, he'll be will not be full of confidence still even though he knows he's the strongest rider in the race he's got the gap I think you'd want to at least crest that next climb before you started feeling like you had it in the back Here is Mohoric again, still settling in, looking good. The climb coming up with those very nasty, what was it, 23%, I think you said, Greg. Yeah, right the at the top. end as well. So it's just got this last, it's, it's hard all the way up, but it's got this final kick at the finish. Uh, it's, yeah, it, a really difficult climb. And like we talked about before, polar opposite to last year's circuit where it was very, very flat and fast, almost to the, to the Citadel gates at the finish. Um, and it was very difficult for the front group to, to split and decide the race. Uh, here today, it, it's, going, <laughs> it's about as hard as it gets. Don't think we're going to have any danger of what we had last year, are we? With all of the, the lapping and people getting in the way in the final kilometre or two of a world championship battle. This is going to be the winner alone. We saw it yesterday with Kashani Viadoma, who pulled off a fantastic victory. Today, Mate Mohoric once more looks back. Yeah, well, I think whether he's asking the motorbike guy, whether he's got any information, definitely nervous. He knows that Vermish is there somewhere. He won't be aware of that mechanical that cost him that 10, 15 seconds. So he probably thinks the gap's probably more like 20, not not, not the 37 that it is. Uh, Vermish, you know, he's a strong, strong rider. You don't finish on the podium in Roubaix by accident. So he knows he's got the endurance to finish off. He's got you know, that, that real fight still. Uh, and on this technical climb, if the legs buckle on this sort of type of climb, you can throw away 30 seconds. We saw Connor Swift on a climb of only 500 metres. Um, the legs were, were causing him some troubles there and, and lost 40 seconds to these guys. So it can be easily thrown away. That was San Vigilio. This is Colagu, and the gap is coming down. Looking at those tyres, is everything all right? Everything's good. And we talked before about the different options. Mohoric looks like he's running a road-style setup, so two chain rings on the front, uh, and, a, and a more of a, a normal size road cassette on the back, so more of very much a traditional ride. Whereas Vermish running more of a traditional, or what's becoming a, a gravel setup with one chain ring on the front and, a, and a, a wider range of gears on the back. Five seconds have been chopped off the gap in the last half a kilometre, and here's the chaser. Florian Vermeers might have something special to say yet. Yeah, 
from Morale Vermish just wants if he can have a a view of Mohoric, even just a little little clip, that will give him that real boost in the morale to, to dig in, find that extra gear, knowing that it's still possible. But as we've got these switchbacks at the moment, Mohoric will be out of sight, out of mind. So under this Kolagu climb, again starting with the concrete, and you just see the holes cut in it and the lines drawn to help the water run off. Mohoric definitely in that first gear on this one. So we have slightly smaller front chain rings than, uh, than on, a, on a road bike. Uh, similar size rear gears, but on the front just slightly smaller just to get, help with these super steep and especially if it gets loose as well. When you get loose, you can't get out the saddle and kind of muscle the bike like you can on a steep road. You've just got to stay seated like we see Mohoric now. Keep the cadence up uh, and, and keep the pressure on the back. It's starting to swing back to the Slovenian. 38 seconds. And this is Mohoric's terrain compared to Vidmir. So we've seen it already on the last couple of climbs, haven't we? Yeah, and I think for Mohoric, he's, it's where we've seen it so far. If it gets really loose, so more more off-roady than it suits uh, Vermish. When it's road, it definitely suits uh, Mohoric. He's, he's got the horsepower descending. I think he's got the edge. So if it's a road descent, he can get a small gap. But Vermish, if it gets really loose, it doesn't like, quite suit Mohoric's style climbing or descending. Looks around the corner again. He won't see anything for now. There's a lot of tree cover here. What you're going to see is, what, 10, 15 seconds ahead or behind. It's 38 now, with seven kilometres remaining of these World Gravel Championships for the men in Veneto, northeast Italy. Yeah, the vital statistics of Collagu. Yeah, 23% it shows there, like we talked about. Maximum grade, 11.8 for 1.7 kilometres. So savage savage climb but we see one board to bottle on Mohoric's bike difference obviously between the road and the gravel today in the road they've got chance to get food from a car and water from the car but also from the side of the road today eight tech zones so it's harder to stay hydrated they need to carry more of their own food from the start they might be able to take some food from the side and, and sustenance but generally they need to carry a little more on their bike than they would from a road race and the issue is because you don't have those following cars that you can use late on into the race it's easier to make a mistake with the nutrition and, and to, to run out of energy in a gravel race, 100% compared to a road. Again, there's a look behind there, maybe force of habit, see where the car was following and <laughs> get a drink. I think it was more likely to see if Connor Swift was in attendance. We do not have a timing chip on him at the minute. We don't have any camera motorbike with him, so we don't know how far he is. We knew the last check, it was a good 15 kilometers or so ago, he was a minute and a half behind. The good thing for Connor Smith, when he did get distanced by these other two guys, they had nearly four minutes on the next group of the four, one, two, three, five riders. Uh, Svensson, Hermans, Demarkey, Valverde, and Schomberger. But they had a good gap, and you would have thought that hopefully it's seeing whether Connor Swift, again, we're focusing on the battle for the win, obviously, but for Connor Swift to, to get that bronze medal. And here is the change in surface off the concrete road, onto the stones and dust. Oh, and this section is so difficult. It's the most difficult part now in these water bars. The chance of losing grip on the wheel wheel and coming to a halt. And then it's so difficult to get going again. Getting a gap going when you're already in a top gear, loose surface. It's just about staying seated. And we saw similar, I mean, we looked at Roglic in the Tour of Italy, you know, losing his chain in the time trial on a water bar. The same thing can happen here with these guys times two, because you've also got such a loose surface as well. 45 seconds. 10 seconds have been put into the gap on this climb by Matej Mohoric. He's given himself room in case of any issue, in case of any mechanical problem. It's now that tight left turn off one surface onto another that's been taken by Vermeers as it narrows to a path here for Mohoric. Again, there's those big bumps in the, the road. And the sort of water runoff sections, as you mentioned. Yeah, and those are the ones, they just because they're not straight, if they were straight, you can roll over them. The fact that they're on this angle, it encourages that wheel just to skid out to the left. Um, and then you're hitting, normally with these water bars, you normally get a bit of gravel sits up against them. So you normally get a deeper section of gravel right up, just where you don't need it, where just where you're applying a bit of extra power. But he's crested the top. That'll be a huge, huge relief. One technical descent left to go. 350 metres to go until the top of Kulagu. There you see it. 
350 meters. Oh, hello, hello. And here's this technical descent. And this is almost mountain bike downhill. Yeah, I mean, super rough, super loose. And he's <laughs> going a little faster than I would probably advise at this stage in the race when you've got a gap, you know, really, really pinning it down there, using right up onto the berms on the side of the road. Yeah, well, that's the not difference, isn't it? He doesn't, he doesn't know the gap, I think, no. Ollie. No, he was riding like he didn't think he had 50 seconds. You know, he's absolutely pinning it, taking risk, rear wheel sliding out. Yes, impressive stuff. Not much margin for error. No. <laughs> it's a nervous watch for us. 50 seconds now with six k's to go. And the difference here on this loose gravel, a road, you can you can mess a corner up, come in deep, but you can just you know grab the anchors and take some speed off last minute. On this loose gravel, if you come in hot into a corner, you can't break in the turn. You know, you really are going to lose it. So that was <laughs> pretty impressive stuff. Could have ended in tears. Thankfully, it didn't. Yeah, I was squirming in my seat a little bit, to be honest with you. So Mohoric getting ever closer to the finish line. Yeah, and the chance. It's difficult to read, especially when you're getting fatigued on these descents. See, it, it, you've only got, it's not completely taped off. You've got small, uh, small markers. And the chance when you're descending, you've got to pick the course out. And they might have a GPS on the handlebars. They definitely would have wrecked this section of the course. But remembering all that, when you've already been doing five hours and your heart rate's at 90% of its maximum, is easier said than done. The chance of going off course on this is, is, is a possibility. Again, there's that look behind. You've got 52 seconds, Mate. Again, this last top, this section to the top, loose, steep, but he's done the hardest section. 5.6k to go, not far away. But on that descent, I mean, I couldn't believe the speed he was riding. It didn't need to go that fast, but he was almost racing as if it was going head to head in a World Cup downhill. You know, he's really, really letting the brakes go, taking quite a lot of risks, actually. He's really unaware that he's got this big gap. Mohoric with a rainbow jersey in front of him. Yeah, and it means so much to these guys. Rainbow jersey. There's not many people that get to wear one of those in their career or win one of those. And this gravel is only it's only a, a relatively new sport, but or new discipline in the sport, but it's come up through so important not just for the riders, for the bike manufacturers, the gravel part of the sport, all sales has become so important. Mohoric on the Merida bike, from obviously riding for Bahrain on the road, but on the Merida gravel bike here, and a big thing for the manufacturers to claim this title. The manufacturers will be happy about the change in parkour, won't they? Because last year we, we had this event and a lot of riders, including the winner, turned up on a road bike. Yeah. So last year was so smooth so fast. They were using 32 mil tyres and just squeezing them in a road bike. And if they rubbed a bit, they they weren't too bothered here today everyone on true gravel bikes as far as i'm aware 40 mil tires are common and it's the volume of the tire on the rough surface that makes such a big difference less so the tread it's more the volume that you can run at a lower pressure gives more grip gives more comfort uh, but it's the grip the main thing the comfort's not too much of a concern for these guys but it's having the grip on this uh this you know, marbly sections that's the night you know a real key difference today Kilometers continue to disappear away. Inside the last 5k now for Mate Mohoric. Yeah, it's how he carries speed. Time was almost a minute, wasn't it? Yeah, and it's these transition sections between you've got the climbs, you've got the major descents, but it's the speed, but he's really, really, really pushing hard. There was no hanging around there at all. This is his favourite terrain now. But again, you don't have many road descents like this in races either. So narrow, so steep. But you can get caught out so easily. Obviously, we're not on groomed roads here. No one's come round and checked this out. They've got, there could be patches of gravel on any of these corners that's just drifted down. I mean, it's obviously a dry day today, so you've got a good chance of pinning. But it's just patches of gravel on these descents where one all of a sudden the wheels can go and, you know, really nasty crash at high speeds remembering all the twists and turns as well I think you pointed out earlier it's impossible to memorize the whole course here 
you've got so many twists and turns through fields on and off of surfaces yes you can think about the important points remembering where you're going and it's not as if the signage is that clear either in no. all of them but it looks like you know his famous victory in Milan San Remo it's you know that, that that section then looked pretty close to that but really hugging from going from curb to curb carrying all the speed back onto the off-road now but oof, you know he's, he's leaving it late with the brakes and it's these sections here he's risking quite a lot I have to say, it's fantastically imaginative, isn't it, this course? We were going through people's back gardens, it seems, at one stage. Yeah, it's cracking, isn't it? These ups and downs, ins and outs. You know, it's, it's, it's real raw racing. Popping in, back onto the road again now. But Mohoric, he's, he's pushing. He, you know, he doesn't know whether he's got five seconds or 55. He's nervous. Some sort of little pass where you think you might be walking the dog after work on a weekday <laughs> night, something like that. It's been brilliantly put together. There's plenty of things that, as you've already documented, should have been a lot better this weekend. Oof, need to be. Oh, no, 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 no. Crash, but it looks as though he's OK. Now, back on the bike, what happens? He's lost, what, five seconds, nothing more, I think. And I think that's nothing more than a scare for Matej Mohoric. The thing he was lucky with then, obviously crashing on the drive side of the bike with the rear derailleur, it's, the risk is that you can bend, uh, bend the rear derailleur or the, the frame hanger. Um, and that's the risk when you crash on the drive side. But he's been taking so, so many risks all the way down this descent. Oof. Well, thank goodness for the hay bale as well. But yeah, it looks like the biking piece, in particular that rear derailleur. You know, you bend that one and then that can be a game over. That You could snap that quite easily if you fall off on the drive side. But he's been pushing so hard on the descent, big risks all the way down. I've been squirming in my seat hanging on. And it's all the way down, big risks and braking very, very late on pretty loose surfaces. And we saw it then coming in, little touch of the brakes a bit late on, and it came, you know, laying it down. Just trying to regather himself as much as he can while <sighs> continuing to race as again. It's a very sharp corner that he's ended up on the grass verge there. Keeps it up, he's got 47 seconds. Once more, we remind you, if you're just tuning in, he doesn't know that, but he now gets a shout off somebody. He now gets a shout off somebody there. I wonder if that was the gap, and that is, well, maybe calm down a little bit. Yeah, and we saw it before. There's sections, the, the, the technical thing about gravel is the different surfaces, and you're going from hard pack or tarmac with good grip to really loose surface. And we saw on that right-hand corner then just before the bridge, he had full grip on the tarmac, then he was still turning quite harshly when it went onto real loose, almost like chippings and then the bike just folding underneath him. The key was, I mean, it's really difficult surface to ride, but that's the bit where he um, put money wrecked it, but it's just remembering that when you're, when you're under pressure. Oh, he just went again, another slip and slide. We've just been talking about it. In the, difficult to remember everything, and the fact that it was yeah. such an imaginative course. Uh, I was just about to say that, yes, many things have gone wrong this weekend, which we've talked extensively about, and thankfully there's been a reaction from the UCI as well. But in terms of course design, the organisers have brought something different and much more imaginative as we go into the final two kilometres. But such a technical finish. You know, we've got the hardest climb of the whole race coming, you know, 6K to go, a mixed descent, and then at this finish now, it goes from bike path to road to lane to, to small footpath. Just such a mixed bag of stuff and, and, and almost taking Mohoric out the race. And you saw that last turn from Mohoric, which was perfectly taken, by the way, but you get that one wrong and you're in the river. There's all yep. sorts that can go wrong here. And we remind you, again, I know so many people are switching on for the first time and discovering this. There is no mechanical assistance allowed, as, again, he's on another dog-walking path through the back guard. Yeah, they'll have some basic tools and probably have uh, a, a, a gas canister, probably a, a spare tube, small Allen key set, chain tool. That's what I would take on an event like this. But yeah, not a huge amount of stuff. We see a little seat bag underneath your seat post. So almost as if it's you know, a rider going out for his own gravel ride. They need to be uh, self-supported. But it's these little mixes of you never know of the surface and, and the grip you've got. You could be real marbly gravel. It could be good tarmac. It could be some dirt. And you're never quite sure whether it's just as you're starting to pin it into a corner and set it up, you've got to be really confident of what you're turning on. Just one and a half kilometres now remain. Oof. Not even turning there, but staying upright as there was a change in surface. The speed, though, that he is carrying through yeah. here. And the bike's so loose as well underneath, just moving around on this gravel here. Similar to, I like, say, to Strada Bianca on the road. We saw Tom Pickock winning this year, but 
on the descents knowing where you can push it and where you've got to hang back. Sometimes they can remember it, sometimes it's just the skill of that anticipation that the riders have got. Into the final kilometre now, just gone past the sign. I know that the, the graphic's still a little out, but he's just gone past the one kilometre to go sign now, Mate Mohoric, and he is riding away to the world title. Yeah, and I think that crash, he had a decent gap when he went down. Didn't lose a lot of time, 10 seconds maximum, but no time checks, like I say, no race radios. He might have picked something off, but he's still looking behind. I mean, the guy's been riding in fear for about the last 10, 15 kilometres. Stretches out, and now he knows surely that it's his. 55 seconds to enjoy and celebrate. Mate Mohoric reaching Pieve di Soligo and about to be crowned the world champion. Zips up his jersey, gets presentable and ready because this is one that he is going to remember. He's into the final cape and he's done his job today. He's a lucky boy on that corner. Like I say, if you always go down on that right side, that's with the rear derailleur, and it's so easy just to bend that one or damage it. Like we saw <laughs> Matthew von der Poel at the Worlds going down on that side again, lucky, but damaged the shoe in that case. Mohoric absolutely smashed it, but a lucky boy. It's on this straight, he knows he's won. The celebrations can begin. All of that nervous energy, the adrenaline can be let out on show. He came to prepare for a different objective. He now has one corner and 200 metres to ride and celebrate. A close shave on that corner, but the damage had been done. And Mate Mohoric arrives at the finish, a world champion. Already the owner of rainbow jerseys on the road as a youth. He's now a fully-fledged senior. He's won at the Tour, the Vuelta de Giro. He's won in San Remo, and now he is the gravel world champion. A sensational day for Slovenian cycling, and Matej Mohoric, king of the world on gravel. What a performance. A world two for this man. Florian Vermeers, a very famous second place in Roubaix in his first full season as a road pro. He's had a difficult time since then, but he is starting to show what he showed in that first year again. All the talk for Belgium today was about Vermeers, Gianni Vermeers, the defending champion, and Wout van Aert. But it is Florian Vermeers who finishes in second and takes a silver medal in the Veneto. And while we wait to see if Connor Swift was able to hang on for third, a very, very well-fought race between Mate Mohoric of Bahrain Victorious and Slovenia and Lotto Destiny and Belgium's Florian Vermeers. Yeah, and Mohoric, obviously we saw him going down, 2K out, the right lever on the bike pushed right in. I know there's a bit of a trend to have the levers rolled in for a bit of aero assistance, but that right lever slammed right in, it took a big, big hit. And, uh, but the, how hard he was pushing on the descents, really, really taking a lot of risks. Caught him out in the end, but was lucky to, to get up from that one, get to the finish, but so strong today on those last climbs. There is in conversation with GCN's Daniel Benson. And a happy, happy winner indeed. We'll get the official broadcast interview once he's cleaned up and ready to go for the podium. We wait to see who will complete that podium. We expect that it should be Connor Swift, but that crack was with around 20, 21 kilometers to go. And if it had been a massive crack and the group behind were working well, there's an opportunity for things to change. But nothing changed for Mate Mohoric in the last 20 Ks. The only change was, despite the scare, the gap increased. And he has shown what a mighty bike rider he is. Yeah. Very, very, very impressive ride by Mohoric. Driving that group every time we saw him, almost looking like he's doing the lion's share on the flat in that low on the drop position. So we see him on the road week in, week out. And yeah, so absolutely classic strength for that ride.
Connor Swift, play save, he got dropped, he got three climbs to go, really tough finish, but the time he got distanced by the other two riders, he had almost four minutes on that chase group. We're sitting, hopefully we can pick up some pictures of him soon, but yeah, if he can hang on for third place, unbelievable result for Swift. And here is Connor Swift. Brilliant stuff. Three and a quarter minute down, but he's managed to hang on. He arrives at the finish and he's going to get his reward. Great Britain are going to get a podium place in the men's elite race and it's going to go to Connor Swift. Mr. Dependable on the road. He showed here that this might be his surface. A winner in Trobourg Leon a couple of years ago. He is now a bronze medalist and on the podium at the World Championships. Yeah, that's great to see. And you see, it's, that's probably a pretty torturous last 20k for Connor. But strong ride to make that selection with his other two rides, especially Mohoric, and, and, and roll with him on the flat. We know that Swift's got the horsepower, you know, big a winner but for Ineos, but also, you know, really dependable on domestic for those guys. And um, that, that classics form or classic strength coming to the fore today on this course. I know what you're all asking. Where's Alejandro Valverde? On the last check, he was in a chase group. Is he here? Let's have a look. Looks like Voss and Svensson. Oh, no, Valverde. It's Valverde and it's Svensson. Valverde and Svensson. <laughs> now, is this the fight for fifth, fourth and fifth? If it is a fifth place finish or a top five finish for Alejandro Valverde, well, that is quite incredible after having been retired from the road for a year. Yes, he's done a handful of gravel races, but if you look at who has been at the top here, the kind of rider, the level of rider, what they've been doing all year, it is nothing short of spectacular. Yeah, I mean, that's not a bad two up, is it? You've got Valverde, one of the most successful road racers of all time. Svensson, the US gravel chart, gravel star, first gravel worlds, fourth and fifth. Well, let's have a look. Looks just like they do look at each other a little bit. We presume these are fourth and fifth in the race here. They're into the final kilometre now, and they're starting to look at each other. Spencer just sitting on the wheel. He knows who he's with. He's probably spent half oh, his adolescence watching him on the <laughs> telly. Well, very well. Does he remember what to do in these situations? Surely he can't have forgotten in a year. But Spencer and Lassiewicz, yeah, missing the gravel world, actually rode the road world for the US, so um, he knows how to handle it in a sprint, I think. Interesting to see how it goes. A reminder that it's fourth and fifth place up for grabs, and Valverde means made to stay on the front here by Swenson. Yeah, I don't think he'll be best pleased about that. <laughs> oh. Valverde in the white jerseys we see from the helicopter here. It's the blue with the white stripes that belongs to Keegan Svensson. Again, Valverde looks around. a year to the day that he said goodbye to professional road cycling at the Tour of Lombardy and here he goes still looking there's nobody in the shop behind him they can afford to mess about the top five is between these two fourth and the spot off the podium is what's at stake they go into that final quarter Valverde leads it out with 150 meters to go does he still have the speed at 40 plus years of age he's hanging around but Swenson's coming around Valverde to the line and it is Alejandro Valverde who beats the young pretender and the old man finishes fourth what a magnificent performance for a man who's been retired for a year wow Valverde still has it. He beats Keegan Swenson, the US gravel star in the sprint for fourth. And here is Quinton Hermans, who's going to finish on his own in sixth place for Belgium. Cool to see Valverde sprinting it out, gravel bike, big flared bars. Yeah, super cool. I said early on, there's, they've all had it on pretty good authority from the team himself and El Sirio Unswe, who today is here that Valverde had asked to return. The request was denied. He showed today he still has it. Matej Mohoric certainly has it. He is the world champion.
Now for Italy, Simone Velasco is their top finisher. He takes seven. Interesting, after De Marchi have been very high up and the best placed Italian for some time. Had a mechanical last week. Wonder if the same problems befitted him again. And what a comeback wow. this is from Wat van Aert, who, when I looked after his crash, he was minutes behind. He wasn't even in the top 50 at one of the time checks. But here he is, Wat van Aert, what a superstar to finish in eighth place. Be interesting to see the split. I think after his crash, he was more than 10 minutes behind the front guys. So he's clawed back right, right, right back. Probably the fastest go on course between the last few splits. Can you imagine the sight that must have been of him passing all fantastically elite riders? It's not the case that we had last week in Belgium. It was all the age group riders and very good amateurs and semi pros being passed. But Wat van Aert has come from a heck of a long way back there. When we came to her, I was checking the timing screens and wondering where he was. He was well outside the top 50 and minutes down. And here he is in front of Alessandro De Marchi, who will finish ninth. Two Italians inside the top nine. Three Belgians, including Fanart, but the winner comes from Slovenia. We wait to complete the top ten. It's going to be Sebastian Schoenberger from Austria who will do that. He's going to come down almost ten minutes down. Yeah, strong ride from Schoenberger. He's yes, 11th last year in this race, 10th today. But, you know, he's a strong road rider, you know, human-powered health. 38th at the road world, so, again, one of those strong guys for the big days. So ten riders across the line. We'll get the classified check on the results for you in a moment. I can tell you that it's almost 10 minutes that separate first to 10th. Nine minutes, 42 seconds to be precise. And here we are. The final top 10 at the end of the men's 2023 Gravel World Championships. Mate Mohoric is the world champion. He'll wear the rainbow jersey after beating Florian Vermeers and Connor Swift. It's a Belgian in second, a British in third, with Alejandro Balverde at 6 minutes 47 in fourth beating Keegan Swenson, the best US finisher in fifth. Hermons Velasco Fanart after a pretty serious crash and a big delay to get assistance is eighth with De Marchi and Schoenberger rounding out the top ten. Yeah, when you look at the time gaps, 9.42 back to tenth place. So it just shows how savage that circuit was today. To split these guys over nearly ten minutes is, yeah, that's a big gaps. Well, they've enjoyed the party today. Many have ridden over the weekend as well. Yesterday, victory for Kasia Niviadoma. Today, the honours have gone to Matej Mohoric. This the moment he was crowned the world champion. Be interested to see how many times that jersey gets worn the next year, whether these guys will start taking some time out from, from the road races to do more of the gravel racing. We saw Gianni Vermish a couple of times wearing the jersey in some of the World Series races, but most of the time, obviously, they're, they're, they're racing on the road week in, week out. It's going to be interesting to see the pressures from the manufacturers as well who sponsor the teams, the teams and their road objectives, and the calendar itself. You wonder if the calendar will even be engineered to go around having these stars competing in the races. It's a very, very complicated jigsaw to put together. There will be certainly lots more things to think about like that going forward. Yeah, we saw the European Championships last week when Jasper Stoiva and the winner was interviewed, kind of angling to saying he would like to ride Riven today, but was doing Paris Tour. Um, and it's that real conflict, but I think you'll see more, more road teams in putting time into, into gravel. We see it on the mountain bike side, uh, Van der Poel, Alpin de Koenig, having 
a, a mountain bike team, but also having more of an interest in gravel as well. So it's, I think it'll be becoming more commonplace that, that there's more multidiscipline teams um, mixing up. Predominantly on the road, I think that's still the biggest discipline, but, but more on the mountain bike and gravel, I think, next year. Well, Pieve di Soligo from the air. It's been packed to the rafters today. The crowd on the course as well. Because Belgium last week was very special. And we get the feeling that next year the buy-in to that in the World Championships will be something special. Yeah, Worlds next year, next year. Different circuit, or different style of circuit, should I say. It's um, flatter. Uh, faster, you know, a lot of wooded sections, uh, which when we raced last week were, were very dry and carrying speed, but in bad weather would be really, really hard going and quite slow. Um, but it's a flatter, a flatter parkour. Well, we'll see if we can bring an interview with the winner for you, as we are, as we explained heavily yesterday, relying on the images coming from the host broadcasters and the organisers. And of course it'd be great to have a look at the podium, wouldn't it, and see Matej Mohoric's moment of glory. He's had great success in World Championships in Italy, hasn't he? Remember, he took... Uh, the title down in Florence for the under 23s. A decade ago, here's how he pulled off his victory. Connor Swift had already been dropped by this time. And it was Florian Vermeers who was the man he put the time into. So the back end of the circuit, this all these four tough climbs in real quick succession, and it was this third climb to La Serre where he got the gap, and then the time just went out and out and out. I think it was a real cracking circuit to get this mixture of fast kind of farm roads, the gravel, the descents, and these stiff climbs in the back end. We talked about it before. It's going to be so decisive. Smaller group was split before that, you know, on the long, or by halfway, we had a front group of three and a rear group of five, a second group of five. But Mish, small technical issue, but the damage had been done already, but it's last, cost him 10 seconds on the descent. And as you could see by the time he was back on his bike, it was over half a minute, wasn't it? Mohoric had nervous moments. And again, most of it coming through the lack of information. No following car, no race radio. Yeah. Taking a lot of risks that if he watches it back, he'll feel were unnecessary. But I guess this is all part of this new game, isn't it? Yeah, it'd be interesting to see. I mean, there's some stipulations with the type of bike, but I don't know if there's anything to say about banning radios. I'm not 100% sure, but I mean, that information we saw on the descent, he had a big gap, okay, but on the downhill, big risks. Amazing crowd, what's the feeling right now? Yeah, uh, the feeling is great. I mean, uh, the parkour today was beautiful, and uh, I had one of the best days on the bike. Uh, I enjoyed so much. Uh, as a kid, I always wanted to start mountain biking, and then uh, I started to, to practice road cycling because my friends did. Uh, but yeah, today, I really enjoyed it. It hurt my legs, but uh, I was happy. My mind was super happy, so uh, yeah, uh, congrats also to Florian and uh, and Connor. I think they were also super, super strong, but I used uh, the weight advantage on the climbs in my favor, and uh, I'm super proud of this achievement. When did you understand you could win this race? I always believed since the very start. I did my best to try, uh, and uh, yeah, the more uh, I was getting through selections, the more I felt I have uh, good legs, and uh, then I knew the final. I, I, I reckoned the last 40K, and... Uh, I knew it's super, uh, you, if, if I tried to design it myself, I, I couldn't do a better parkour. Uh, it was a super technical, uh, super sharp and steep climb, so that suits me perfectly. And I just wanted to give my best. I wanted to, I knew I had to hurt myself and the others will also 
suffer and at the end, yeah, uh, I managed to hold on all the way to the finish. In the end, also a little risk on the band you slipped. Yeah. Uh, what, what did you think? Of? In the recon, I went around uh, on the path and then in the race I saw you could cut, so I figured I'd better to cut, but it was not a great idea and uh, I slipped out, but uh, yeah, I, was, I stayed calm and I knew I had a small gap over Florian, so I didn't panic. You already have been world champion, but what's the meaning of this jersey? I mean, this is an, an elite title, and I think this discipline is, uh, has a great, great future ahead of, ahead of, uh, ahead of it. And uh, I think it's going to be very popular in the future, so I'm super proud of this achievement. So you will come back uh, racing in the Gravel World Championship? Oh, yes, if I can, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. He's always a very good interview, isn't he, Mate Mohoric? I like the fact he said when he was younger he fancied being a mountain biker, but <laughs> he went on the road because his mates did it. <laughs> That's kind of cool. <laughs> but yeah, always he's one of those guys. It seems like you know he, he rides a mixture of bikes. He, he, he likes going, and, and the fact he said you know just enjoyed it. You know, I think that's a key part of it. They, the, the riders themselves are enjoying mixing up the disciplines, keeps it fresh, keeps them on their toes. It's a top ten again. Mohoric will have enjoyed it more than anyone else as the world champion. Florian Vermeersen second, Connor Swift third, Alejandro Valverde still going, and fourth, winning a sprint ahead of Keegan Swenson. Hermans, Velasco, Van Aert, De Marchi and Schoenberger in the top ten separated by almost as many minutes so two years in the Veneto we now go to Belgium and Flanders for the world championships next year imagine that this is an evolving event you mentioned that word there fun it does look great fun to ride I think we've maybe still a little bit to work on trying to make it into a television spectacle as well and I know that the gravel traditionalists might not like that but if you do want it to be followed and watched and competed by everybody that, that has to do it and a lot of it has to do with how we broadcast technically and things like that doesn't it in terms of time gaps and things and but I think this is something that is going places yeah it was good to see it, it, the, the helicopter filming today really really helped it gave some fantastic views of the racing but also uh, the local terrain and but I think it's it's following normally we've got a lot of motorbikes filming the racing they're rising in and out of single track, and it was amazing that we did be able to get those pictures of Mohoric descending when he was, you know, literally pinning off the banks going down the gravel. They would have been filming that off a, you know, an off-road motorbike. So um, it's, it is difficult to cover, um, and I, but I think things will improve as more riders take this. I mean, we're seeing, you know, Keegan Svensson, Wout Van Aert, Mohoric, you know, superstars from different parts of the world different disciplines it will just help raise the interest and, uh, and the sponsorship and, and then i hope that will lead to better coverage and especially our sport obviously we stay covering the women's race as well as the men's well equal coverage yes that is the first thing that needs sorted and thankfully we have had well you have to say an overdue promise from the uci that it will be part of the contract to host and i don't think there are any worries going to belgium next year because that's something that Thankfully, is part of Belgian cycling coverage now, but something that really should have happened this weekend. And again, from our point, there was nothing we could do about it, given the fact that the images came from the host broadcaster and the lack of images meant we couldn't show you anything yesterday. And of course, apologise on our behalf and we desperately hope and I'll require everybody that that changes because uh, it's just simply not good enough did like last week the fact we covered both races on the same day I thought that made for a fantastic yeah. spectacle I'm not sure what your your yeah I think that. the men's and women's running both together what starting one minute later and with flipping between the coverage at some times we had we had both races on the screen at one time I thought that was really cool um, the only thing I'd say last week we were running alongside the age group races and we saw a mix up between lap riders Yes. I think that is difficult to explain, <laughs> to commentate on, explain, and the water point race for the racers to get involved. They're going past lap riders, uh, but I think yeah, men's and women's at the same time worked, worked really cool. I think, and we got good coverage and, and fantastic racing from both. Um, I think what'll be really cool thinking about it is the 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 riders and, and the calendar for the gravel racing. Obviously, we saw his Paris Tour today stopped some racers riding. I mean, it's easier said than done. 
there's a mountain bike World Cup in Canada today, the final. Uh, we have Paris Tour on the road. That's stopping a number of the disciplines getting involved. Uh, I think it would be fantastic to see Gravel Worlds on a, on a weekend that didn't have a, one of the World Cup or biggest kind of monument races. Um, it would be good to get even even more of the, the superstars from the sport. You know, it'd be great to see a, a Peacock or a Pagaccia involved in this race as well. It will come, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I think, again, this is personal preference, and I think it's certainly a conversation, a debate that has to be done, but I personally would prefer to see the elite races run together and then the age group stuff. I mean, I'm of the opinion that that should not be involved in elite cycling. If you want, us, if you want it to be a true elite spectacle, they should not be influencing the race. But the men's and the women's together, I thought, was fantastic. And if you can get the age group maybe to race a different day, and you know, that doesn't need to be televised because it's not elite sport, is it? But if we're talking about elite sport, the professionals, the very best. I think it's something that, you know, could become Gravel's own to have, you know, its own identity to have the two races at the same time because it, it is different to watching road racing. And, and I think the rhythm of the race lent itself very much to be able to flip between one race and the other last week. And there was always something happening, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah, it was fantastic. And I think, yeah, we, we can focus the coverage on one ride. Uh, I think it's great. The one thing at Gravel is really cool is that there is a partition participation element to it. Um, and that what makes it so attractive. It's got that London Marathon vibe where you have the elites racing, but then participation. But yeah, yeah, they're not, not on the same lap. I think that's a, a bit you of a shouldn't be influencing the result of, the, of a world <laughs> title. <laughs> Here's the podium net. And the nature of the park all today meant there was no influence whatsoever. Yeah, we can see there's definitely a body type on that podium. Same height, <laughs> same build, same weight. Well, they've all raced each other, and it's been a full gas, very, very difficult race today. Connor Swift on the right-hand side is going to step onto the third part of the podium. Florian Vermeers from Belgium on the far side down the turquoise jersey with a Belgian flag across his chest. He'll be stepping on to step number two. And in the middle, on the top, in green, representing Slovenia, the new world champion who is Matej Mohoric. A yeah, cracking ride by Connor Swift, making that group of front three, getting distance when the climbing really started to kick off with about 25k out, but holding his own, keeping it going, and then holding off that chase group of four, your Valverde's, your Svensson's, to take a bronze medal, which is, yeah, cracking ride. There's the rainbow jersey. Only one of those awarded, of course. And that's going to Matej Mohoric. Bronze and silver medals as the VIP parties being introduced. They include, of course, present of European cycling Enrico de la Casa. He stood next to Luca Zaya, who's second from right on the left hand side there. He's the uh, regional president of the Veneto and a big sponsor of cycling in the region. A president of the Italian Federation here. Mario Dagnoni is uh, along to present the bronze medal to Connoisseur. Remembers he has to step up on the podium. <laughs> Should know he's been there before on the top of the things as well. Former British champion on the road. That's a very good ride from Connor Swift today. So Senor Zaya presents that silver medal to Florian Vermeers. And there's a jersey to be pulled on before a gold medal is taken by Matej Mohoric. And the rainbow jersey will be presented by Mr. De La Casa. He is the president of the UAC European Cycling. Uh, it's been a few years since he pulled one of these on. He's an under-23 the last time. He's now a fully-fledged elite rider. Victories in the Giro Tour, Vuelta later. And, of course, the Classicissima Sanremo on Italian soil as well. But it's a world title, an elite world title. 
champion of the world on the gravel, Mate Mohoric. And I think a cracking winner for a gravel champs. A newish discipline, and it, it, it's building in, in importance and respect. I think Mohoric just takes up another notch, you know, one of the superstars from the road. It will get a lot of coverage, uh, and I think Valverde swinging into fourth place as well. We'll get some good headlines, and Svensson will really get a, a lot of press in the US, and he's their, he's their superstar over there, and I think it will just help raise that gravel to another level, and we'll see even more riders from all the disciplines coming in next year. And yeah, Connor Swift, yeah, third place is wicked. Here's the Slovenian anthem. Another big moment for Slovenian cycling. Mate Mohoric this time delivers it. He's the gravel world champion. Just ahead of Florian Vermeers and Connor Swift. It's with this image we leave you from the Veneto. From Oli Beck and Sarah and me, Rob Hatch. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again soon. Goodbye.
Better to go, to go away because they don't want to shower by wine now.